Good morning, I say, Bonsu. How are you doing? You well? Uh, great. It's great to be here. How are you? I'm blessed, always, in all ways. Really appreciate talking to you because uh, you're the uh, you're the man at the moment. There's a, a huge exhibition taking place at the Tate Modern, and um, I was at the press briefing where I really caught a sense of your fervor uh, for having delivered this, and just you know your team. You know, I, I want to point out, and I know you made a point of. Uh, I like the fact that this is a team effort. One of the things that really struck me when you were speaking at the media briefing, though, I say, was the role of uh, Akile and Bembe yeah. in shaping the thinking behind a world in common contemporary African photography, the mm. exhibition that's taking place. So speak on on that as a start point, because uh, I think there's a lot of people that will be intrigued by uh, Mbembe's journey. Absolutely. So Achille Mbembe is a Cameroonian-born philosopher based at the University of Cape Town in South Africa um, and who in many ways has kind of shaped uh, an important intellectual discourse around concepts of African history, African philosophy being sort of central to a kind of um, a cosmopolitan and an international, uh, let's say, understanding of the way in which we think about ideas of not only African history, but its place in the world. So he's a uh, he's an historian and philosopher that's addressed important themes around post-colonialism and its afterlives, um, ideas around global ba- blackness, ideas around networks of cosmopolitanism and what cities might look like in the future. He's addressed multiple things, but one particular idea that Mbembe has kind of um, explored throughout his work is this notion of a world in common. Uh, which he views as a kind of uh, a sort of a, a, um, an idea or a conception of the world um, that's thought specifically from Africa um, and that's thought in relationship with a kind of planetary knowledge of the world and the wider ecosystem. So it means thinking about the kind of um, ways in which we view the other, that which might seem culturally or socially, politically other to ourselves as being kind of integral to the way that we exist and understand our being in the world. Um, So there are many important contributions that Achille Mbembe has made to the field, but I think particularly in relation to this exhibition, which uses that notion of a world in common as a point of departure, it was really this idea of African knowledge systems, be they indigenous knowledge systems, pre-colonial knowledge systems, forms of spiritual knowledge, all of which inform the way in which um, you could say uh, we can rethink our relationship to the world. Um, so that that provided a very rich context, let's say, for the exhibition. But the exhibition is really conceived of a, as a journey. So it takes you on various twists and turns, as you know, from 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 coming to see the show earlier this week. From what you were saying earlier this week, I guess you're hoping that this exhibition goes somewhere towards challenging Western representations of Africa. Speak on that for a second. Yeah. So we know that the f- photography has been in use on the continent almost since its invention uh, around 1840. Um, but we also know that photography has been used as a kind of colonial tool or an imperial tool to kind of fix the representation of African subjects and cultures. So one key example there would be the early ethnographic use of photography to kind of classify African peoples. We also know about the ways in which photography has kind of been used to document African landscapes. Um, and then to kind of further knowledge of those landscapes um, and environments. And we know that the environmental ruin that that's led to, we know all of the pressures that that's put on particular communities. But we also know a lot about the ways in which photography has been used and appropriated by African communities throughout its history. So um, actually throughout the 19th century, there were very many um, uh, uh, portrait studios across coastal towns, mostly in West Africa, where people could go, particularly upper middle class families could go to have their portraits taken. Um, really as an extension of uh, the kind of honorific medium of studio portraiture in which people will go to have their portraits taken for weddings, birthdays, family events, a kind of act of commemoration, and this continues to the present day. So there is a section of the exhibition that really honours that history, but there's also a section of the exhibition titled The Living Archive, 
which is looking at the ways in which artists have kind of reimagined those colonial representations and brought new meaning to our understanding of photography's colonial history. So it tries to deal with these multiple histories at once and tries to look at the camera's role both as a tool for liberation, but also as a tool for systematic forms of oppression and actually embraces those contradictions because that's the way in which artists are dealing with photography now. They're just as interested in digital photography as they are in historical archives. Mm. Talk on then the intersection between yeah. photography, video and contemporary African art to address the historical legacies and envisage, envision a more hopeful future. Yeah, that's a really important question. The role of video in the exhibition might be confusing to some because people hear photography and they think, well, photography, it's a fixed image in a frame that's been printed um, and it has a particular kind of, um, uh, let's say, representation for many people, a, a certain use. We all understand photography as maybe something that we'll put in a frame and then place on our mantle, uh, family photographs, etc. But video plays a very important role in the exhibition. And I think, as you're alluding to, it plays a role in ways that maybe expand our understanding of what photography can be. Uh, the idea of the moving image as this way of representing uh, cultures that are in movement. So specifically looking at the history of African masquerade, which, you know, when many traditional forms of African masquerade were conceived, they were conceived as social, ritual, um, even political acts, let's say, um, that would allow people to commune not only with their ancestors, but with the cosmos, with the environment, and really ground people within their own sense of cultural heritage. And then what masks ended up becoming over time are these static museum objects that are framed either in images or in vitrines. Um, and those are uh, that that is quite common in the way that we encounter masks nowadays around the world. But actually, um, in many traditional African cultures to this day, uh, masquerade is a practice that is a performance practice. So you couldn't talk about masquerade as a tradition without looking at masks in movement and looking at masquerade as a performative practice. So artists like Zina Zarawiwa, who literally use the mask to embody a different spiritual reality, and artists like Wuru Natasha Ogunji, who uses the mask to speak about the ways in which women's bodies have been excluded from those practices. And I think I really wanted to kind of embrace those tensions and give artists space to kind of look at the relationship between photography and moving image. So that's why there is video in the exhibition, but it's kind of interwoven in a way where you're not just sitting in a dark room watching a video, you're seeing it, it being interconnected to, like you said, the intersections between photography and video. If that's one aspect of pulling this together, then speak on the thematic sections of the exhibition yeah. and how they how they shed light on cultural heritage, spirituality, urbanization, yeah. and climate change in Africa. Like, because yeah. st stitching those themes together couldn't have been easy. Yeah, absolutely, it wasn't, and it was. But it was important because if the show had just focused on portraiture or just focused on the urban transformation of African cities, it would have been a disservice to the breadth of uh, expression, artistic, cultural, um, social, um, that many of these artists um, demonstrate through their work. So I kind of uh, uh, sort of developed the chapters in dialogue with the artists and within dialogue with those works, reading about them, understanding them in more context. And that's very important when you're organizing a group exhibition. You want all of the artists to feel that their work speaks to each other, that they're not, not actually being shown merely because of their African identities or because of their, uh, let's say, you know, maybe a sort of um, assuming that their work fits in, within a particular kind of prescriptive categorization of photography, um, but that the themes, actually, the ideas, the kind of cultural knowledge that is released through these works um, is what brings these works together. So the first theme, identity and tradition, is looking at themes, as you said, of ancestral knowledge and spirituality in the first instance through traditional African monarchies that not everybody is familiar with, these um, structures of governance that predate colonial imposition um, that were in place really um, and that presided over um, many ethnic groups across the continent that were more diverse than we can ever imagine. But what we know today is the kind of formation of nation states um, that were in many cases formed by um, colonial governments as a way of kind of, um, you could say, sort of separating off borders for all sorts of reasons to do with trade and um, the kind of, um, you could say, the sort of uh, uh, the the 
uh, economic and commercial interest in those borders. But what I wanted to do in the first section with Georgia Sodi's Nigerian Monarchs, which is this kind of um, uh, uh, documentary work that looks at over 100 Nigerian monarchs who no longer hold constitutional rights in Nigeria, but who play an incredibly important role as custodians of culture, as intermediaries for their communities, and to really think about the representation of those monarchs as being key to the, a different way of understanding cultural heritage. So the first section, um, Identity and Tradition, deals with that. It also looks at notions of masquerade, spirituality and ritual. Um, and then in, this, in, the, in the middle section of the exhibition, the second chapter, you could say, um, titled Counter Histories, we deal with some of the tensions I was alluding to earlier, that friction between portraiture as a way of fixing representation, as a way of thinking about family, community, identity um, in the broader sense. Um, and that would also include LGBTQ communities that are not always accepted in Afri traditional African notions of family, one could argue. Um, and then you're also looking at the archive and spaces where um, artists have used the archive to challenge uh, narratives around nationhood, narratives around the politics of um, independence, and kind of thinking about the ways in which the archive becomes this active system for building new types of knowledge about culture and identity. And then in the final section of the exhibition, Imagine Futures, um, it's this kind of open-ended, um, I hope you'll agree, section that takes you on through various landscapes. So you're looking at, um, you know, uh, images of the Sahara Desert with a lone woman kind of traversing this landscape in which she is carrying water, uh, presumably into an unknown future. But that's a work by the Ethiopian artist Aida Mulene, who's thinking about the kind of labor and the burden of uh, labor placed on women in many African communities to sustain their families, to sustain society in a sense, but who are not often given leadership positions or seen as being at the forefront, let's say, of Africa's um, political and social futures. So that particular work, Water Life, is an attempt to kind of demonstrate not only the resilience and power of women, but how central they are to many African societies and societies world over. And then you've got artists dealing with the urban landscape, you know, Andrew Osiebo looking at the way that uh, Lagos has transformed over so many years to become this kind of metropolis, one of the youngest and most populous on the continent, of, uh, dare I say, it, in the world. Um, that's constantly undergoing new architectural innovations, uh, kind of conflicts between tradition and modernity, as communities are shaping their own realities on a daily basis. And again, these ideas of resilience that are made not necessarily by utopian ideas of Africa, but by lived experiences and by realities that are ongoing. So that was an attempt in the final section to look at some of the complexities around what it means to represent the future. And then the final section of the exhibition is this sort of um, attempt to really delve into a more poetic understanding of the landscape and it's the kind of crescendo of the exhibition really the final act Julian Knox's in praise of still boys a London-based Sierra Leone born artist who takes you into the history of Freetown in Sierra Leone a town uh, founded by formerly enslaved uh, Africans from for or Africans living in the diaspora including Canada Jamaica the U.S all of whom had returned to Freetown um, as a way of building a new kind of community. And I think in that work, he's trying to honour not only that legacy, but his own journey of having left during the war um, and returning as an adult, kind of reckoning with uh, these still boys, these young men who live by the water, who are kind of building, um, you could say, their own sense of identity in a world that doesn't always acknowledge their humanity. So that's how we wanted to end the exhibition and tell this story of a world in common. 36 photographers. Mm. Um, how did you narrow that down? Um, you know, uh, Tate Modern and Tate as an organisation set up a committee called the Africa Acquisitions Committee in 2011. Um, as a committee that would help expand and deepen the representation of artists from Africa in its global diaspora. And over the past 10 years, we've been able to acquire really some groundbreaking works by many artists on the continent. And I've been fortunate and colleagues of mine have been very fortunate to work with those artists to bring their works into the national collection, Tate's collection. And that in turn um, has allowed us to put on displays, to create public programs that invite these artists in. So there was certainly a network of artists that I knew should be rep present in the exhibition because there was an existing interest in their work, which I should say, you know, might be a surprise to people, but as much as you do a lot of research in relation to curating or working on exhibitions, 
Um, it really is also about your personal relationships and how you understand the artist's work, the kind of impression that their work has made on you as an individual. But I try to look as broadly as possible and to do as much research as possible. And then what you tend to do is you kind of narrow it down to the artists that you think um, sort of uh, help uh, to elaborate the narrative of the exhibition, but also whose work is kind of foundational for the ways in which certain ideas and concepts come together. Um, so I think that the show is kind of indebted to many of these artists for making the work in the first instance. And then we as a museum become the kind of custodians or the carers for the work while it's in our care. But the argument I always make, particularly as it relates to uh, you know, African art and African cultural heritage is that it it belongs to its communities, right? So ultimately, you're thinking about why these artists made this work. And often, they didn't always make it to be sh to show it in a museum, they made it for their community, for their peers, for their colleagues. So it was about thinking about the relationships between artists, many of the artists know one another, many are in the same networks. Uh, to give one example, Aida Moulene, who is one of the key artists in the exhibition, her work is on the poster, set up a photo fest in Addis called the Addis Photo Fest that happens, I think, biannually, where she brings together young African photographers to create workshops, networks, kind of festivals that celebrate African photography. If she hadn't built that platform in Addis, I don't know that a show like this would be able to happen. So that's right. really where the, the thinking comes from and the networks come from. And then in terms of the process of selection, you only have so much space, right? And one of the things that we really wanted to do is make sure that the work didn't feel like it was competing for attention, but that you really had time to digest each artist's work and go deeper into their vision, knowing that it's just one body of work. And some of these artists have been practicing for 20, 30, 40 years. Um, so it's about acknowledging that these works, are, this is a kind of sample of multiple artists. But if you're curious to know more, we've created a space outside of the exhibition called Common Ground, where families, communities, individuals can gather for free to read books, to communicate, to have uh, just to just to really rest, which is a kind of quite a radical concept in, in this moment in time where people are often they feel like they're short on time and short on uh, resource. And maybe they're looking for something to do on the weekend. I would encourage people to come to Tate, if not to see the exhibition, just to spend time in Common Ground, which is a space uh, created by the designer and photographer Ronan McKenzie um, as a kind of space for communities to gather. So that's part of the exhibition, too. It's, it doesn't stop when you leave. We hope that people go do more research, connect with these histories, look up these artists and kind of gain new knowledge about uh, African photography in the process. For those who are watching, I'm sure they've been well uh, briefed on what's in this exhibition. It's going to be on for six months. Make sure you get down there and check it out more than once if you can. Yeah. Um, you might need to actually. I, I know I'm going to. I'm very privileged to be able to do so so um thanks for bringing this to market so before we part ways though there's going to be a young man who's very interested in or woman who's very interested in art and who's looking at you and wondering who you are how you find yourself in this space yeah i can imagine it's been a journey so just um as succinctly as you want really mm -hmm. how do you find yourself in the position that you are you did tell me the title before we got on camera but i've forgotten so just yeah, for those no, who I'm, so I'm curator of international arts at tate and i've been in this position for coming up for four years now i started i studied uh art history and kind of cultural studies at university so i knew i wanted to work in the kind of field of culture but i didn't know if it would be tv radio museums as you know it's all interconnected but I had a particular interest and investment in working with artists that was really exciting to me. So I started out my career writing, making exhibitions in small venues. I My first exhibitions were at the Student Union at my university. So I really kind of cut my teeth uh, doing things with friends and with people that um, would work with me uh, in a sense. But I didn't ever see myself as being... Uh, 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 qualified even to work at a museum like Tate because there were so few people who looked like me. Um, and I tried to uh, effectively really just build up my network. I was fortunate that around the time I was beginning my career, there was more and more interest in African art, specifically here in the UK, but around the world. And now there are more and more positions, actually, whether you, you, you want to do PhD research or work in a museum or uh, sort of develop your knowledge of art, there are more and more opportunities if you want to do that. So I would just encourage people to undertake uh, their, actually follow their own instincts to actually 
uh, try to learn as much about art as they possibly can, but also to build their own network organically by communicating with whether it's an artist that they know around the corner or an artist that they've heard about in their community. Just start to to kind of, um, in a way, make yourself useful um, and and do as much as you can uh, while you can, actually, especially if you're a young person, uh, because opportunities will be generated only when you start to, in a way, build your own reality. And I think that's a big uh, message that this show tries to impart is this notion that, you know, while there are so many obstacles facing us as a society, particularly now with um, some of the themes that we've discussed, um, I wanted to impart this message of agency because many of the artists in the exhibition don't come from privileged backgrounds. They weren't, they didn't come into the world assuming that they would become um, internationally recognized photographers but they took up that uh kind of sense of um you could say sort of uh, uh agency of will of hard work and determination to realize their dreams and i think if you think in that way anything's possible but it's also just being mindful of the possibilities of, of of building a community in the process which i think is 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 what sustains you in the long run in terms of how you see art in this country you spoke quite glowingly mm. about the Tate Modern mm. kind of reminded everybody it's a millennial institution it's not been here for for that long mm. um and their place is is still being defined and I guess redefined right as we move yeah. right yeah. so in terms of in terms of just how you see the landscape at the moment yeah. where art black contributors and and just the appetite to yeah. receive and perceive how do you see where we are in 2023 yeah, I think that's a great question. And I would say the landscape has changed drastically in the 10 years that I've been working in the art world. I would say that what uh, Tate Modern represents to so many is a kind of international institution that aims to be a home for art from around the world, but that connects that art to a London public in the first instance, because our community is a South London community, which is something that I was really eager to acknowledge in this exhibition. There will be um, a Tate late at the end of the month where people can come and um, on the last Friday of, of, of July, uh, you know, meet young black creators living in, in London, African diasporic communities who are uh, part of really important discussions and all of that information is available on Tate's website. But to your point about the future, I think it seems to me that there is much more of a, a, a kind of um, a space for dialogue now and a space for championing um, and questioning also established narratives of art history, but also across the board, across the kind of cultural industries, be it theatre, art, um, music. And I think one of the things that I would want to really um, sort of impress is this idea that um, maybe it's about... Uh, taking that sense of ownership into our own hands that rather than waiting for cultural institutions like the Tate to recognize Black practice, it's about creating Black spaces in which conversations can grow and flourish. And if Tate and other organizations can recognize that work, then fantastic. But first, we have to see a value in recognizing one another. I said, Bonsu, I could sit and talk to you for another half an hour quite easily, but I so appreciate much. your t your time's limited. But thank you so much. Thank you for bringing this uh, exhibition to life and wishing it all the success moving forward. Thank you so much. Come back anytime. <laughs>